in now. So we are ready to begin. Keith Beth, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. In my few remarks, I shall try not to trespass into areas of expertise of other speakers who have far greater knowledge of their particular fields of interest than I. Instead, I shall take an overview based on my observation of more than 35 years at the helm of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, or WFM IGP as we know it. 100 years ago, a mere fleeting moment in geopolitical history, the nascent League of Nations was just one year old. After the war to end all wars, its covenant included preventing wars through collective security and disarmament and settling international disputes through negotiation and arbitration. Of course, no nuclear weapons existed, although the trenches had seen the devastating effect of chemical weapons so poignantly described in Wilfred Owen's poems. It took the second global conflict in a generation to achieve the first international criminal tribunals at Nuremberg and Tokyo. This first holding to account individuals rather than states for what had occurred introduced the concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity. The conflict also saw in 1949 the four Geneva Conventions. Admittedly, uh, they drew on earlier conventions onwards from 1864, for which we have to thank Henri Dunant, uh, founder of the Red Cross, after seeing the horror on the battlefield of Solferino. But uh, their consolidation was a major achievement. Many of us have lived much of our lives in the Cold War under the threat of mutually assured destruction that an aggressive move by one superpower with instant retaliation would ensure total annihilation of humanity. It, it now seems farcical, but it was real. And we may be faintly amused at the casual and callous naivety, but today the concept of Star Wars and hypersonic delivery vehicles dropping warheads anywhere in the world, allegedly now a Chinese capacity, is little different. What has changed is that the cost of such weapons is now prohibitive for many, many of the other than the most wealthy state nations, and a great cost to expenditure on social welfare, infrastructure, and those items the public crave. Yet, while precision guided warfare is proving for most to be a too expensive luxury exercised only by states with deep pockets, we have to live with the cheap lethality of the suicide bomb the terrorist outrage and countries with sophisticated armies and equipment being defeated by determined, sometimes fanatic irregulars armed with a Kalashnikov and a bellicose ideology. The last century will be remembered not only for the Holocaust and two devastating world wars, but also that in its latter half, the weapon of actual mass destruction was the machete small arms remain the major causes of death in conflict. Perhaps the closest we ever came to complete security through disarmament were the mccloy zorin Accords of 1961, which sought to establish a foundational roadmap for all future negotiations and international treaties with regard to nuclear and general and complete disarmament under effective international control. It actually went further and sought to abolish war as a means of settling disputes and was to be, and I quote, accompanied by the establishment of reliable procedures for the peaceful settlement of disputes. It was unanimously passed by the UN General Assembly and in the UK in 1963, Harold Wilson, soon to become prime minister, speaking for the Labour Party in an address to the Fabian Society, said that he would like to establish a separate ministry of disarmament an idea echoed more recently by Vijay Mehta in one of his books. We now actually do have a shadow minister for peace and disarmament. But perhaps the importance of a reflection on these events is to take heart that they are possible and we have seen significant advances. That is why only recently WFM has launched a new initiative to reinvigorate the former idea of three plus three, engaging China, Russia, and the USA with Japan and the two Koreas to create a Northeast Asia nuclear weapons-free zone. Despite the non-proliferation treaty, 
we do see an escalation in the threat of nuclear weapons with the danger now that non-state actors may possess them. So the initiative is very timely. WFM was also in the forefront of working with the then Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago in re-energizing the idea of an international criminal court, first mooted during the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, following the First World War. It came to fruition through a few but determined states and the coalition of the ICC of some two and a half thousand civil society organizations worldwide, keeping them up to the mark. And as we all know, the Rome Statute was signed in 1998. Perhaps we are too close to it, but when the history books are written in a hundred years time, I believe that this will go down as a landmark in the advance of the international rule of law. For the first time in history, a permanent institution was created that held not just states, but individuals to account for the most egregious crimes. Now, I shall not trespass on Jennifer Trahan's area of expertise, namely the inadequacy of the mechanisms at our one international body designed to keep the peace, the United Nations. But perhaps the most egregious example of this failure of leadership is in the refusal of both China and Russia to refer the case of the Rohingya to the International Criminal Court. Although, of course, as we know, the ICC has initiated its own investigation on the basis that forced migration occurred on the soil of Bangladesh, a signatory to the Rome Statute. China and Russia, time and time again, have maintained that it is a bilateral issue between Myanmar and Bangladesh and should not be discussed at international forums. They objected to the chairperson of the United Nations Independent International Fact-Finding Mission on Myanmar, addressing the Council as to its finding on the refugee crisis. They stated that the mission's mandate was not to brief the Security Council. It was also asserted that as the Security Council's duty was limited to protect international peace and security, it should not get involved in country-specific human rights violations. Well, this is a highly selective and minimalist view of what might constitute a threat to world peace under Chapter 7 of the Charter. And Article 39 states clearly, the Security Council shall determine the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of the peace or act of aggression and shall, shall make recommendations or decide what measures shall be taken. Fortunately, the General Assembly was not quite so pusillanimous and did not feel itself so restricted. But the inactivity at the highest level has led to some rather interesting collateral acts. The Gambia, with the support of 57 nations of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation, filed a lawsuit against Myanmar at the UN International Court of Justice, which has declined to rule on whether it is genocide, but stated that Myanmar must take measures on an emergency basis to protect Rohingya Muslims and to retain evidence of possible genocide. In Argentina, a case was launched under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Now that's interesting because an investigation under the principle of universal jurisdiction would be able to look into atrocity crimes committed against the Rohingya inside Burma and not just in Bangladesh. So this has wide implications about the ability of countries to claim they have jurisdiction over international crimes and whether the complementary principle of the ICC allows a state to investigate and prosecute under universal jurisdiction similar allegations that are being investigated by the ICC. In a way, the stultification of the Security Council may have opened a Pandora's box and shown other ways of dealing with such issues. Now, I've concentrated on the rule of law, especially international criminal law, being an important vehicle for building peace, security and justice. Yet we should go further. Although many international treaties, especially involving trade, have a dispute mechanism, there are many that have no judicial oversight or ways of compelling compliance. Let me conclude by referring to global governance in which the lacuna is clearly in many cases a democratic deficit. I mentioned international treaties, 
and many of these have associated parliamentary assemblies of democratically elected representatives of the member states. Some are more effective than others in scrutinizing the workings of such agreements. The Council of Europe's assembly can play an effective role, condemning, for example, repression in Belarus, action of a clean and safe environment, and combating racism to just quote some recent themes. There are regional assemblies, perhaps very prominently, the directly elected European Parliament, which evolved from a nominated assembly of representatives of states parties to the European coal and steel community, and its history being evolved into a fully directly elected democratic representative regional body is really one that sets out a roadmap as to how other assemblies might evolve. So if all these assemblies in their own way bring the representative voice of the people to the table, then one asks, where is that voice at the G7 and G20? Informal but important groups of states that make decisions affecting us all. It is true that Bond was appointed as lead of the C7 to coordinate dialogue between the UK government and civil society organizations at the recent uh, summit uh, this year at Carbis Bay. And Civil 20 is one of the official engagement groups of the G20, which provides a platform of civil society organizations around the world to bring forth the political dialogue with the G20. Maybe that is a beginning, but it is far short of direct democratic involvement. Perhaps even more fundamentally or more importantly, one asks where is the people's voice at the UN level alongside the Security Council and the General Assembly? I do not mean the IPU, which has interesting discussions as I know from my own time attending them as a British MP, but where are international parliamentarians as an integral part of the UN system? A principal cause of the World Federalist Movement, which I have had the privilege to chair for many years, is the creation of a UN Parliamentary Assembly, with only consultative and not legislative powers at first, which may come later through evolution, as with the European Parliament, but with the power to scrutinise the working of the UN and its agencies, to hold them to account and to make recommendations, just as all parties select committees do, scrutinizing their governments in many countries based on the Westminster model. For me, these are the essential elements and goals for a sustainable system of universal peace, security, and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. I would now like to invite VJ Meta. VJ, I did put you on mute, so you may need to take yourself off. DJ, you're up. DJ, you have to come off mute. You're, you're muted. We can't hear anything you're saying. Thank you, Lilius. Thank right. you, Lilius. Can there you hear you me now? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Distinguished Chair, Sandra, speakers and delegates, welcome to this online conference jointly hosted by United for Peace and World Federalist Movement. What we are exploring today is can strong institutions build peace, security, and rule of law against the backdrop of the realities of today's world. There is something terribly wrong with our world. A very small percentage of its population do control the fates of almost everyone else. And they are doing it in an increasingly disastrous fashion challenging and extreme geopolitical problems, continuous wars, under challenging 
extreme uh, uh, nuclear proliferation, poverty, inequality, COVID-19 pandemic, climate change crisis, violation of human rights, and other insane policies and practices which endanger our own lives. Dear friends, the global institutions do not operate on human morality and intellect. This, the disclosure of Pandora box or Pandora papers reflect that reality. The current global system of political governance and leadership are overwhelmingly elite class oriented and all global institutions are operated by pre-screened elite leaders who are disconnected to any relationship to the people, by the people, for the people now. But remember, we are all in the same boat. It's so it's pertinent how global institutions can respond to geopolitical problems. What policies and practices the global governance should adopt to save the planet and the people living in? Why is global governance not effective? Because UN, World Bank, IMF, etc., are outdated and a relic of the Second World War. They are slow bureaucratic and poorly equipped to handle the present global challenges. <coughs> Besides, the le leaders and governments of rich Western countries are relentlessly pursuing their narrow agenda, national agenda to the detriment of the planet. For example, they're, they're the organizations like NATO who after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact is looking for a reason to exist and has yet to be demolished. Dear friends, it's evident from continuing wars in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, genocide in Myanmar, which Keith referred to, the UN, one of the foremost global governance institutions has no power to prevent conflict. Nuclear proliferation, war crimes and crimes against humanity. The negative consequences of all this is that the military spending is gone to its highest two trillion US dollars, mainly spent by the five Security Council members, USA, China, Russia, France, and UK, who, who happen to be also the biggest arm makers and war mongers and conduct fearlessly military operations in violation of UN Charter and international law. The present confrontation of China, Russia, and signing of the military pact AUKUS between Australia, United Kingdom, and USA. Alliance is all the signs of aggression, which could bring the world to the brink of major war or World War III. The global threat of and global, sorry, the threat of global warming and environmental damage and climate change crisis is so great, it has the potential of destroying our civilization. We will hear a bit more from Jojo Mehta about it. But what I'm referring to is that <clears throat> if we were serious in tackling climate change crisis, then why emissions from global aviation, shipping, and military or the use of petroleum by the military are not included. While 
green uh, while greenhouse gas levels have hit record high. It makes one wonder who gives the orders and who rules the world. It, it, and also it comes to another question, how can we strengthen, as Keith, which Keith was referring to, the rule of law, a, a global order based on rule of law. A key strategic measure of international community needed over the next decade is the UN reforms in the area of, area of enhancement of international law in order to reinforce multilateralism and boost global governance capability. The International Justice Institution, I'm aware of the fact that there are many barristers in this audience. The International Justice Institutions, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, <clears throat> and the UN's human rights architecture should be strengthened in terms of both their jurisdiction and effectiveness. In addition, the UN represents an opportunity to pave the way for new institutions to fulfill existing institutional gaps. Hence, we, I support the creation of an international anti-corruption force as well as an international judicial training institute to ensure the requisite capacity, skills, and knowledge across international courts. So we need reform and a more robust international rule of law. <clears throat> I, I, I am going to suggest my own three steps for global governance or building a peaceful future or for our peace, security, and justice. My number one step would be creating ministries or departments for peace, which I <clears throat> advocated in my book, How Not to Go to War, establishing departments for peace and peace centers worldwide. And also to appoint a minister or a secretary of state for peace and disarmament. Costa Rica is a shining example of creating one such ministry for peace and justice, shifting the focus from war making to spending the huge military budget for reducing inequality, healthcare jobs, and preserving the planet. My second step for the global governance will be countries to be part of a of the continental of a continental union. Dear friends, every country should part should for, uh, become a part of a union in their continent, like the European Union, Asian. UNESCO, African Union, North American Union, Australia and Oceania Union. This I flagged in my 2016 book, Peace Beyond Border. Before the formation of the European Union, Europe was at war for the past 1000 years, 30 year war, 100 year war, first, first world war, second world war, etc. The wars went on. Only after the formation of the European Union, we have a period of prolonged peace in Europe for the past over 75 years, a feat never before achieved in European history. And my third and last step will be every con continent become a part permanent have a permanent seat at the united nations the united nations is not all rosy it is, needs to be reformed it's, it's full of flaws but that is the international body 
we all meet in, discuss, and all the leaders get together in UN in September. So if we work through it, we can do our bit on global governance, and we could live in a more harmonious uh, global environment and tackle all the uh, challenges of climate change, insecurity, global pandemic, poverty, inequality, attacks on individual and collective rights. In France, we do not need to accept living in a world where trillions of dollars are poured into the military worldwide for nuclear missiles and space rockets. Our challenge is through global governance, seeking peace, security, and justice where rule of law prevails. I think we can build the world we desire by bringing deliverable changes that can make for a fairer and more su sustainable and peaceful future where we can overcome justice, where we can overcome injustice with justice, oppression with opportunity, and hate with hope. Things do change. Europeans have made Europe peaceful for the first time in history. Apartheid era is gone. There was Cold War, but then the Soviet Union dissolved. We had a, recently, we had a reunification of Germany. Individuals, organizations, and countries, let us cooperate on a global scale to, to take bold but doable practical steps to change things around and sow the seeds for a more peaceful and prosperous world. Let me end by saying, Immanuel Kant, the great philosopher of the 18th century, argued that humankind learns from history and war, but only the hard way. Let me summarize that there are no more lessons to be learned that can be sensibly drawn from armed conflict. The architecture for global peace is now within our grasp. Through the spread of ministries for peace and European Union-like regional union, working, working within a reformed United Nations. They are the last hope for peace in our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay, for those excellent and passionate points. We are already getting questions in chat, but I'll hold it to the Q&A. I would like to welcome next David Swanson. David, I believe you have a PowerPoint you would like to share. So if you'd like to try to share your screen, uh, we could commence. So to everyone, David Swanson. Let me know if, uh, thank you. Let me know if you're seeing the PowerPoint okay. And if you're hearing me okay, I'm going to start a little 10 minute timer here and see what I can get in. Um, it, wonderful to be included in this event and in such company. And I don't think I've disagreed with a single thing uh, that I've heard from Keith or Vijay. Uh, wonderful remarks. That's it's This is extremely rare for me. I can disagree uh, even with myself in the space of five seconds. Um, so one of the things that uh, we ought to make everyone in the world more aware of, uh, and that is virtually whited out from knowledge and conversation uh, in the United States uh, and many Western communication systems, uh, is the illegality of war, the requirement under the Hague Convention of 1907 to settle disputes uh, peacefully, the absolute and total ban on war in the Kellogg Briand Pact of 1928, the, the ban on virtually every war, including every major war of recent decades, uh, and even the threat of war in the United Nations Charter, the, the repetition of that, the, the commitment to the UN Charter, e even in the, the founding document of NATO, uh, and of course the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, uh, which now has been updated to include uh, a ban on war 
war or what they call aggression in order to recklessly give respectability to the nonsensical idea of defensive war uh, so that war is prosecutable uh, individuals. Uh, and of course, the, the, the ignorance uh, of this state of affairs is achieved primarily through silence and censorship, also through pretense, through misleading claims of UN authorizations through the use of irrelevant UN resolutions, etc. Uh, and to a great extent through misdirection, uh, through the pretense that war is actually law enforcement rather than law violation, uh, through the, the obsession in, in the United States with congressional war, with the, 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 the notion that war isn't really a fundamental problem, it's a problem of who authorizes it. Uh, and as we all know, bombing victims first concern is always whether a, a president or a parliament bombed them because it's only okay with them if it's a parliament uh, and the, the the notion that if you get a big enough gang together if it's a nato war it's more legal uh, and and all the endless coverage of the laws of war all endlessly implying that war can be done legally if certain steps are taken uh, again, in the United States, the conversation is all about war powers uh, and where they are properly exercised. Uh, there are no conversations about rape powers or torture powers or child abuse powers, just war powers. Uh, and even that conversation uh, is very poorly done. Uh, the, 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 the bills in the U.S. Congress at the moment in both houses to reform and revise uh, and both improve and weaken the War Powers Resolution of 1973, uh, you know, for, for all the good in them, even if you stripped out the bad, uh, are nowhere near as good as actually using the existing law, uh, the, the existing War Powers Resolution. Um, this notion of a war of a rule-based order being pushed uh, by the world's uh, biggest weapons dealer who is uh, meeting today with the, the biggest religious leader on earth who opposes weapons dealing and not a single media story has mentioned that fact uh, is, is outrageous given the US bullying of any supporters of the International Criminal Court of anyone proposing to use universal jurisdiction the this the the outlier nation of the United States as, as the leading non-ratifier of major human rights and disarmament treaties, uh, the blatant violation and shredding of disarmament treaties, the outrageous record on, on human rights, uh, the leading role in weapons dealing and base building and the, and the status of those bases outside of local laws. The, the, the leading waging of war and facilitating of coups and imposition of sanctions in violation of the Geneva Conventions on dozens of countries uh, and the whole status of militaries uh, above the law when it comes to pandemic protocols, climate agreements, types of weapons possessed, proliferation in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in Europe, et cetera. Uh, so COP26, uh, if you go to COP26.org, here is a proposal to stop giving militaries a waiver from climate agreements and include them in those laws uh, and make them laws, not voluntary minor pretenses uh, with Tesla proposing to build tanks to save us all and so forth. Uh, and the to give you an idea of how out of whack the state of people's minds is in the United States, we have people actually complaining now, well-meaning progressive people complaining that the U.S. military isn't going to be attending, uh, whether armed or unarmed isn't clear, the, the, the COP26, we don't want them attending in Glasgow, we want them held to the laws that are created there. Uh, so what can be done? We can be more active and more strategically active uh, in the heart of the beast uh, here in the United States uh, and in other law-breaking and war-mongering countries, and we can do more locally and more globally in the way of activism, as we're doing right at this moment, because nations are so corrupt. Um, and and the, the pursuit of good treaties, absolutely critical treaties, like the ban on nuclear weapons by the non-lawless nations of the world is, is critical.
We can support the ICC. We can support universal jurisdiction. We can hold out the model of Afghanistan in pressuring countries not to join in a threat of war on, on China. The nations that participated in the war in Afghanistan created terrorism back home in exact proportion to how many troops they sent to join in the war on Afghanistan. Uh, we can pass laws locally, state, national, regional, provincial levels on divesting from weapons. Uh, the, uh, yesterday, I learned that the Rotary Club, a major international institution that we should be allies with on much of what we're discussing, has decided to divest or largely divest from weapons. Um, and of course, as already discussed, we could democratize or replace the United Nations. Um, what we need to learn how to think through in order to do these things, we need to outgrow this ancient barbaric notion of just war theory concocted by people who actually thought that killing someone was doing them a favor as long as they had the right religious beliefs. Uh, absolutely ancient, barbaric, bizarre uh, origins of this theory that has never made any sense. Uh, we can oppose this notion uh, promoted by all the big human rights groups uh, that human rights are something that exists only outside of war so that you can you can bomb people in war and have the world's leading human rights record. Uh, we can oppose the notion that war legalizes crimes as long as they are deadly crimes, murders, drone murders. So we have lawyers claiming that drone murders are murders unless they're part of war and then they're perfectly fine. Uh, we can oppose the concept of murder as only being a crime in certain circumstances. We can reject the absurd idea uh, that war or the threat of war is a way to correct human rights abuses. It's not that China doesn't engage in human rights abuses and needs to be held to account. Uh, it's first and foremost that threatening to bomb people <laughs> is, does not have a record of improving human rights behavior, quite the reverse. Uh, and you can't do what needs to be done, holding people to the rule of law while hypocritically leading the violations of those laws. Um, we can reject the idea of vigilante powers of one nation claiming the right to run around the world bombing people for human rights. Uh, and we can condemn the whole mindset of nationalism, patriotism, uh, things that we desperately, desperately need. We need cooperation between the major militarized nations, environmentally destructive nations, economic powerhouse nations. If the United States and China and other major governments can't work together to solve the problems that we have no choice but what to solve and are instead going to focus on generating manufacturing uh, hostilities and problems uh, in the shape of of war uh, and struggles over things like Taiwan, where virtual, statistically, virtually everybody doesn't want to be part of China or to be rescued and made independent. They want to be left the hell alone. Uh, we we can we could also find the means to work around nations. Uh, so we need a whole different mindset. We need to pursue the reforms already discussed here today. Imagine if we had an earth security industry with the sort of funding that national security gets. Imagine if there were an actually intelligent community, maybe like, uh, you know, some of us here, if that's not too outrageously arrogant, uh, with the power possessed by the so-called intelligence community, which is, of course, neither intelligent nor a community, uh, how much better off we would be. 10 minutes is up. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. I know you have to leave, but thank you very much for all those excellent and interesting points. We look forward to discussing further. Next up is Stephen Hoffman, QC. Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, speak this afternoon. Um, I'm afraid that um, the first thing I have to do is to tender an apology because I've been suffering from a rather bad cold this week, nothing more serious than a cold, but um, it has inhibited me slightly. And um, so um, if I begin to falter or begin to sound rather hoarse, that's the explanation. As I say, nothing more serious than that. 
Um, the second thing that I'd like to say is um, how grateful I am for the invitation to join you for this session. Um, uh, I haven't, I confess, had a very long association with the World Federalist Movement. I think I was introduced to it fairly recently by a very old friend of mine called Peter Luff, who is probably known to some of you. Um, you may find this hard to believe, but he and I were at school together probably about 50 years ago, maybe even more than 50 years ago, um, and we've remained friends ever since. And uh, it's certainly been a privilege and a pleasure to join in one or two of your discussions and indeed to listen to this afternoon's discussion, which has already proved, as other speakers have said, very, very interesting. And I agree with uh, whoever it was who said a few minutes ago that um, it's hard to disagree with anything that has already been said. Um, and uh, of course, I strongly support the ideals um, for which you all stand and which you're all campaign campaigning for. Um, I think <clears throat> what I've been asked to speak about, however, is a very specific proposal, um, which Peter and I have been working on for a decade or so and promoting and speaking about in different places, mainly in the UK, but elsewhere in the world too, uh, which is a proposal to set up a new international environmental court. Uh, we call it an International Court for the Environment, ICE or ICE. Um, and um, uh, that seems to us to be quite a good name for the sort of new judicial tribunal that we would like to see set up, um, which we hope, and I'll explain how this would work in a moment, we hope would at least contribute to the fight against climate change, which is one of the biggest problems that the world faces at the moment. Um, it, may, it, it may not have the same terrible immediate effects as the sort of wars that some of my predecessor speakers have been talking about, but undoubtedly it has the capacity to cause as much suffering or maybe even more suffering than most, if not all, of the wars uh, in history that we have um, sadly had to experience. So that's, that's the concept, an international court for the environment. I sometimes say that uh, the notion of an ICE is perhaps slightly more appealing than if one were to call it a World Environment Tribunal or WET, which doesn't have quite the same ring to it. So we, we decided to call it an ICE and that's what we've, um, that's the label that we've chosen. Um, now, if I can just say a little bit about the background to this, and I hope the lawyers present, including um, Keith, of course, our, our chair, uh, will, will forgive me for making one or two rather obvious points. But for the benefit, of perhaps, of anyone who isn't a lawyer, let me explain, or remind you at any rate, that whether you're talking about uh, um, a court whether you're talking about the legal system in a particular country or indeed whether you're talking about it at an international level, the law really falls into two categories. Category number one is what you might call legislation. These are laws in what we would normally regard as the true sense. And um, no country can function seriously as a civilized country without laws. Um, and indeed, at an international level, I guess that the equivalent of the laws which we have in our individual countries is probably the treaties. We don't really have an international lawmaking body as such, um, but we do have treaties, one of which created, of course, the United Nations. And um, there are many, many other treaties, some involving small number of countries, others involving a large number of countries. Um, I, I, I like to think of the treaties as being in some way equivalent to international legislation. All right, all of that is good. And if those legal mechanisms were enough to guarantee uh, the objectives that we seek, then that would be great. But in our own countries and at an international level, we find that we don't just need laws, 
we need a separate institution known as the judiciary to interpret those laws, to apply the laws in particular cases, and to give rulings as to how the laws apply to particular factual circumstances. And by doing that, the judges who are the uh, who, who um, uh, are the people who um, occupy places within the judiciary, the judges not only decide cases, but in doing so, they establish legal principles. Um, in, in, um, in some countries, especially countries which, whose legal systems originated in Britain, in some countries we have what we call the common law, where um, there's an established concept that the, the cases that the judges decide are to be followed in future cases, the decisions are to be followed in future cases. Not every country has a, a, exactly the same system, but I suspect that almost all countries um, have a judicial system in which the laws are interpreted, in which the judges decide how they are to apply in particular cases, and in which principles expanding on statutory law are established. Now, the point that we have made um, in talking about an international court for the environment is essentially this. There are, there are some countries at least in which the courts have been able in very recent years to make progress in establishing principles which help to combat serious environmental issues like climate change. Um, you will be aware in particular, for example, of one or two cases in countries like the Netherlands, where the courts have been very imaginative and progressive, and where in those particular countries, they have held um, not only that the government itself has taken inadequate steps to combat climate change, but that even um, com companies like Shell need to do more to, um, to address those issues. But the countries in which that sort of progress has been made at a judicial level are relatively few and far between. I mean, these cases, climate change litigation, we sometimes call it, have proliferated quite a bit, particularly in the last five years, I suppose, but um, um, perhaps not uh, yet to the extent of making a serious impact on the problem. And, and, and at, at an international level, and this is where I come to the crux of the issue, at an international level, there have been relatively few cases uh, and relatively few courts in which um, there have been, there's been the development of principles which would deal with what we call transboundary harm. So, the issue arises where in a particular jurisdiction, and you don't need me really to identify which jurisdictions we're talking about, but in a particular jurisdiction, industrial activity of various kinds is contributing to the environmental problems that we have and to climate change in particular. And those countries around the world, usually countries which are relatively less well off and which have populations which have many uh, social and environmental needs, those countries have very little chance of um, using the law to improve their situation and using the law to achieve a remedy in respect of these problems, what we can call for short transboundary harm. And what we feel is that if one were to set up uh, uh, an international court for the environment, and I'll say a couple of words in a minute about how it would work, and perhaps leave that for questions, but uh, if one were to set up an institution like this, which could receive complaints about transboundary harm, and which could adjudicate on those complaints, that would be not only for the benefit of the population of those countries around the world, which are affected by transboundary harm um, 
and by, for example, the rising seawaters, which um, are brought about by um, excessive emission of greenhouse gases. If one were to set up um, this kind of judicial body, which could lay down some principles about transboundary harm, that would not only be for the benefit of those who are adversely affected by it, but it would, would in fact be for the benefit of those countries which are causing transboundary harm and for perhaps um, industrial activity within those countries, because we would have some clarity. You can't shut down heavy industry in every country in the world. You certainly can't shut it down overnight because we need the resources that are brought about by economic activity to solve many of the world's problems, including the sort of problems that other speakers uh, in this meeting have talked about and uh, problems that um, those who speak after me will be talking about. What we need is a better articulation of the principles so that we can strike a balance between harmful activity and activity which, though it may in the longer term be harmful, can be justified, at least in the short term. We need judges to strike that balance at an international level, just as they do in courts in various different countries uh, in deciding on environmental cases. So that's the basic concept. Um, I won't... Um, take more than a moment to just to outline how it worked. Uh, we don't see this court as having to occupy grandiose premises with um, uh, impressive classical pillars outside like some supreme courts around the world and with um, with judges wearing formal robes and even wigs which we still do in most courts in the, in the United Kingdom. Uh, this court, like so many courts around the world now, could operate virtually, um, may not even need to have premises at all, but it would have senior figures, senior judicial and maybe scientific figures as members of the court. It would hear cases which people bring. It would give those against whom claims are made the opportunity to appear. Initially, at least, until we had an international treaty, um, those, those uh, uh, respondents to the claims would not have any compulsion against them to appear, but they would have the opportunity to appear, and it would be up to them to decide whether they wanted to defend these claims or not. But you would end up with a series, I suggest, of rulings, similar to the rulings on so many issues that we get from Supreme Courts around the world, whether it be in the United Kingdom, in the United States, in India, in South Africa, in Australia. These courts have slightly different names, but they all have the function of declaring what the law is and establishing the principles that are so vital for the protection of humanity and for the protection in this particular case of humanity in respect of the kind of environmental problems that we are all experiencing. So I'll stop there, if I may, um, and be very happy to expand on this concept later on, if that's appropriate. Thank you, Stephen, very much. Very interesting. International Court for the Environment. It may tie into uh, Jojo's presentation later. I'd like to welcome now Jennifer Trahan. Jennifer, I'm not sure if you have a PowerPoint or not, but hopefully you can share your screen if needed. I don't have a PowerPoint. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to address this group. And I guess um, my remarks spring off maybe where Keith Best left off mentioning uh, why don't we have a Myanmar referral? And that is because it would be vetoed. Um, and we could add to the list, why won't we have a referral related to the crimes against the Uyghurs? And the answer is because it would be vetoed. Um, uh, and there was mention of, um, we need uh, more training for all the international courts. There aren't so many um, because new proposals would be vetoed in many instances. We won't have a tribunal for Myanmar. We won't have a tribunal for crimes against the Uyghurs uh, through the Security Council at least. And that is in some ways maybe the easiest way a tribunal can be created but the politics are simply not there. 
Um, this discussion is about peace, security, and justice. And I think there are so many times that peace, security, and justice, the whole agenda is blocked in the Security Council and it's simply paralyzed by the veto power. So that is um, the narrow harm, um, but I think it's actually quite broad. That is what I'm gonna particularly focus my remarks on. Um, and I'm specifically going to focus on the problem of the veto being used when there are atrocity crimes, by which is my shorthand formulation for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, when I use the formulation atrocity crimes. So I'm going to first outline the problem that I see, um, then talk a little bit about the legal arguments. Um, I actually question the legality of some of these vetoes being cast. And then I, I will conclude with what states, with what NGOs can do. But I wanna also initially acknowledge that I have, a, I'm, have an initiative gathering NGOs who endorse these arguments. And I'm delighted that WFM has signed on to this. So I'm very appreciative of that support. Um, and it really does matter. I go to meet with states and they they do ask, is this you know anything beyond one NYU professor? And indeed it is. I have a, a large number of high level supporters, a large number of NGOs endorsing my arguments and I'm, I'm delighted by the support of WFM. So the problem and uh, these arguments are in a book I've recently written as Sandra mentioned and I'll later put its link in the chat. Um, and I'll first outline the problem that I see. Um, and if we go back historically, we see US, UK and French vetoes related to the apartheid era in South Africa at a time when those countries are awkwardly aligned with the South African government. They don't completely paralyze the Security Council, but they arguably slow the dismantlement of apartheid. There is eventually a buildup to mandatory sanctions, so the Security Council isn't fully paralyzed on that one. In Rwanda, we have the dynamic that the same uh, three of the P5 don't want the word genocide to be used in a Security Council resolution. Because when you use that word, it looks like countries should be doing something because in Article 1 of the Genocide Convention, there is an obligation to prevent genocide. They don't want that word used. There, they're not so much blocking um, it, it, responding. There is also a lack of will at that time. So um, it, that is kind of the dynamics there. I think when we look at the largely um, passive response of the Security Council to all of the atrocities in Darfur, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar, we can say the veto power is playing a role. Um, in Darfur, it is veto threats. And um, these happen when um, there are a number of times when at least nine members of the council, which is what you need for a vote to pass, had a plan to in some way try to curtail some of the atrocities being committed in Darfur, and China insists that the measures be watered down and weakened. So we see this on sanctions. There's never an oil embargo, and that would have been your meaningful sanctions when you're dealing with Sudan. And even the arms embargo, China, through backdoor negotiation it, it is able to weaken. And this doesn't always make the headlines because it's a veto threat. There's no actual veto, but it's because of how we read the veto as if it's above the law. And that's just not the case. Um, they also, China weakens the eventual deployment of peacekeepers, delays their deployment, weakens their mandate. They get to Darfur when most of the crimes have been committed. Sri Lanka, again, it's veto threats. Um, it's, it, yeah, and at a certain point, other countries not even putting resolutions on the table. They know a certain country um, is in, um, you know, is, is in Asia and China is not going to want to see the Security Council um, at all active and, and other members of the council do not even put proposals. We won't even see a proposal for a Myanmar tribunal or a Myanmar referral to the ICHC, I think, uh, you know, unless countries want to embarrass China, which they honestly should. 
So then the public could see what's going on. Myanmar, there was one actual veto. So already in 2007, um, the rest, at least nine other members on the council would have condemned the crimes and China vetoes it. And when you have a veto, um, it conveys to perpetrators on the ground you have almost a green light because you have a protector on the council. And when you have, you can't even get out condemnation of crimes, the Security Council won't be able to ratchet up to its other tools. So the Security Council um, could also impose sanctions, you know, asset freeze, travel bans. It has a variety of means at its disposal. But if it can't reach step one, then it's not going to be able to do anything else. And that is in fact what we've seen related to Myanmar. I think our most shameful set of vetoes have been the 16 Russian vetoes related to Syria, some of which have been joined um, by China. And um, of the 16, I can group them kind of into four groups. Um, I go through a chronology of the vetoes um, in my book and the, fatality statistics on the date of each veto and what is known about the crimes that are occurring. Um, we have a set of vetoes that won't condemn crimes by the regime. Um, and that's early on. And those all get blocked by Russia and China. Then we have the veto of the referral to the ICC. And again, this somewhat conveys to perpetrators, there isn't ICC jurisdiction, you know, so if you want to potentially create some kind of deterrence, you have to convey there is ICC jurisdiction, but no, they do the opposite. There isn't ICC jurisdiction over crimes in Syria, um, which is true again, also of Myanmar for crimes solely committed within Myanmar. Then we have six vetoes related to chemical weapons, blocking chemical weapons inspections. And those are solely Russian vetoes. And you start to wonder, is this really the charter system as it was designed to work? And I think you, it causes many people to say, this cannot be a permissible reading of a power granted under the UN Charter. And then we finally have vetoes blocking humanitarian assistance. And again, you go, is this the Security Council design, as designed to function that one member can block humanitarian assistance? And on, what, on some of the vetoes, I can very much trace the veto and increase death tolls. And it's the blockage of the um, inspections me mechanism related to chemical weapons attacks. Because when you have the weapons inspection starting, you see a um, deceleration of chemical weapons attacks. And then we you have actually three vetoes of the joint investigative mechanism that was attributing responsibility to the side using the chemical weapons, we see increased chemical weapons attacks. So I think we can sometimes trace the veto power to fatalities on the ground. So in my book, I question, is this the charter system as designed to function? Is this legal under international law that you block humanitarian assistance, you block measures in what eventually becomes genocide um, uh, in, uh, against the Rohingya? So I, in, I know the, I think we're not all lawyers here today. Um, I will try to make my arguments not too lawyerly. I have the very lawyerly version in my book um, in over a hundred pages, but I formulate basically three independent arguments. The first one looks at, we say that genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity are protected at this very highest level of international law, which is known as Hughes Kogan's. So I look at the use of the veto power, which is a power found in the UN Charter, which is actually just a treaty. So it is lower down on the hierarchy of norms. It's a subsidiary norm to use Kogan's. And I look at the inconsistency of basically facilitating atrocities um, and the obligation of all states and all actors under international law um, not to commit violations of use Kogan's norms and not to facilitate them. I argue specifically that this violates 
Um, it's basically facilitating the atrocity crimes in some of our situations. It specifically violates the ILC's articles on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. Article 41.1 recognizes a duty of states to cooperate to bring to an end through lawful means any serious breach of an obligation arising under a peremptory norm of general international law. My second argument looks at the veto in the framework of the UN Charter. The UN Charter has certain purposes and principles expressed in its articles, um, in articles one and two. These include respecting international law, respecting human rights, the obligation of good faith, and the obligation to cooperate in solving matters of a humanitarian character. The Security Council is bound to adhere to these obligations under Article 24.2 of the UN Charter. In my book, I look at these set of vetoes, and I argue they are completely ignoring the purposes of the United Nations and therefore a violation of the UN Charter. I've had states respond to me, but the veto is not cast by the Security Council, it is cast by an individual permanent member, to which I respond, if the Security Council has to obey the UN Charter, so do permanent members because they are simply a subset of the Security Council. But by the way, states also have to adhere to the UN Charter and the P5 are also states. And I particularly, um, I know we have some UK nationals on, I particularly aim my arguments at three of the P5 because UK and France have endorsed voluntary veto restraint. They have endorsed the position they will not use their vetoes while there is genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. France actually leads the French-Mexican initiative to that effect, and the UK and France have signed onto the Act Code of Conduct, making that pledge. So my arguments are particularly aimed at the three P5, the US, Russia, and China, that do not agree to voluntarily restrain their veto in the face of such crimes. Um, and I would say that the second argument is the one that maybe makes the most, I have the most res resonance with UN member states. Um, they really um, seem to grab the argument um, that um, these vetoes are, are not in accordance with the UN Charter. My third argument looks at treaty obligations, such as the obligation to prevent genocide um, in the Genocide Convention. Um, informed by um, the ICJ ruling that this is triggered when there's a serious risk of genocide. So you don't need genocide occurring. It is a due diligence obligation of states to do all that's in their capacity. And the permanent members have strong capacity by virtue of sitting on the Security Council and in bilateral relations with states. And it is also an obligation to prevent genocide, even in another country, because that ruling was about Serbia's responsibility for genocide in Srebrenica, in Bosnia, in an independent state. Um, I won't go through the details. Basically, the same arguments are true under common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions, the obligation to ensure convention protections, ensure that great, at least great breaches, common article one violations in the 1949 conventions aren't committed. Um, and these obligations are simply not being adhered to and all permanent members are parties to the genocide convention and at least the 1949 Geneva conventions. So what can be done about this? Um, so I have been meeting with states um, advancing these arguments, asking states to take them up. Um, I've, in the meanwhile, asked for a high level individual endorsement. So my arguments are supported by Hans Karel, who was um, the highest legal advisor of the United Nations, um, uh, and Richard Goldstone, two high commissioners for human rights, Nabi Pillay um, and Zaid Rod Al Hussein. Um, and um, Adama Dieng, um, among others, Lloyd Axworthy, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Canada, Alan Rock, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada, Erwin Cutler, former Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. I seem to attract a lot of Canadian support. I think the Canadians see this as a way maybe to resuscitate R2P. Um, 
I'm very grateful of WFM's sign on. I argue that states need to use these arguments at the UN. And we see this to some extent, Canada recently in an RTP, R2P debate did say that the veto needs to be used in line with international law and the UN Charter. And I'm approaching other states that they need to go on record making these statements and ideally refer this question to the international justice for a advisory opinion um, on the, a simple question such as, is all veto use while there's ongoing or the serious risk of genocide crimes against humanity or war crimes consistent with international law? I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was very insightful. I'm seeing a commonality between all our speakers today in terms of the behavior of nation states and their circumnavigating seems to be diluting existing international uh, institutions uh, and affecting their impact uh, and their potential as well. I'd like to now uh, invite Marilyn Snife to uh, give her presentation. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sandra. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this joint event of Uniting for Peace and the World Federalist Movement. Both organizations place a high value on the concept of unity, which will be the essence of my contribution. Uniting for Peace emphasizes it in its very name, and the World Federalist Movement expresses it in its founding document, the Montreux Declaration, stating that universal membership is a basic principle. We are all unique, but at the same time interconnected. Each one of us is a human individual. And when I speak about unity in my contribution, I would like you to understand that I do not mean uniformity, but unity in diversity. I would like to share my screen now, is that possible? Yes, if you click your green button, share screen, it should work. All right, well, and this is my first picture. Um, the starting point of my perception is viewing the earth as a beautiful, finite and fragile living planet in an incomprehensible universe. When I look at how humans have presently organized themselves upon the planet, I see that the people of the Earth live in separate entities, in some 200 sovereign nation states, of which some are more powerful than others. I also see that these nation states have united themselves on the global level in the United Nations. But since these separate nation states are so-called sovereign and pursuing their own national interest, they are in fact not united. During my studies in international law, I learned that this divided nation state system will always remain in the vicious circle of rivalry and ultimately war. Despite the noble purposes of the United Nations Charter, the present system of rivaling nation states has proven to be incompetent in reaching the noble goals of the United Nations. The rivaling nation states remain captured in their separateness. This system of some 200 nation states chaotically pursuing their national interest is not a natural phenomenon. It has been invented by the human mind so another more fitting and sustainable structure can be invented too. If we want to build peace, security and justice, as is the title of this meeting, we need a new system for the organization of our planetary household. Therefore, we would need to change our thinking so that the system can change. Further development of international law will definitely be a helpful instrument. If we refer, for example, to Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the subsequent Article 11 in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, 
in which the right of everyone is recognized to an adequate standard of living, including adequate food, clothing and housing, and to the continuous improvement of living conditions. It's a wonderful uh, article. Also, the states parties commit to ensure an equitable, equitable distribution of world food supplies in relation to meat. Both documents, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the just mentioned governments, they age from decades ago. But presently, every day, 25,000 people are dying from hunger. As many as 800 million people worldwide go to bed hungry each night. So international law is not a panacea for world peace. It definitely, definitely needs to be strengthened. And this must be done by a democratic process. Indispensable in the process of change towards a new political organization of our planet for the common good is the awareness of unity, interconnectedness, and interdependency of all life on the planet. This could ultimately lead to the institutionalization of global governance based on the rule of law and for the common good. Uh, former uh, United Nations Secretary General Utant addressed the World Federalist Movement in 1970, and then he raised already the importance of the awareness of unity. The sense of belonging to the human community must now be added to and become dominant over other allegiance. Man now has not only the possibility, but the necessity for recognizing and for demonstrating his essential unity. Today, it's a great requirement for progress, for mankind cannot proceed or even survive at all as a divided and warring species. I would like to add uh, to that awareness of unity. I would like to add that the awareness of unity is not only the insight of the unity of mankind as brothers and sisters, but also the awareness of unity and interconnectedness of humankind with nature and other species. All life, the human kingdom, the animal kingdom and nature is interconnected. All is energy. We cannot expect the so needed system change to happen if we leave it to the diplomacy of the nation states. As noted in the old system, I, I call it already the old system, nation states just pursue their national interests. We do not have much time left to survive in this present fragmented and unsustainable rivalry system much longer. The earth is suffering. And if we do not act soon, she, our mother earth, cannot much longer support the life of humankind on the planet. Over the years, however, politically, there has been some progress towards the understanding of interdependence and the interconnectedness of world problems. For example, 20 years ago in 1991, even 30 years ago, the Security Council of the United Nations, who is in charge of maintaining international peace and security, issued a statement in which the interpretation of international security was significantly broadened to include non-military threats to international security. Sources of instability in the economic, social, humanitarian, and ecological fields were included as threats to international peace and security. And very good news, earlier this month, on October 8, the United Nations Human Rights Council passed a resolution recognizing access to a healthy and sustainable environment as a universal human right. Such political initiatives and declarations are very valuable in the process of developing international law and towards raising the necessary awareness of unity and interconnectedness 
for system change. So, but we must be aware that these are not just beautiful words. Because at the same time, the economic privatized system continues to be detrimental to the planet and to humankind in its ruthless quest for profit for the little few only. The present growing inequalities do not hold promises. The planet is plundered in search for more and more profit for a little few. Every day we receive alarming messages about the state of the earth and loss of biodiversity. If this is to be continued, in the end, also the little few will have nothing left either. The present political and economic models are intertwined. It is publicly known that large private economic entities spend billions of dollars on professional lobbying to influence the policies of states, including in the so-called democratic states, with the only few to raising more profit for the little few. This is, of course, a very undemocratic practice that reminds of the early days of democracy when only the rich men, no poor people nor women, were allowed to vote. If we want to build peace, security and justice through the rule of law and global governance, we need to visualize and design alongside a new political global governance model, a new economic model in the service of the whole of humankind and with due respect to our planet. We need to reallocate the Earth's resources, the common good of mankind. Through sharing alone will justice be confirmed. We cannot leave it up. <clears throat> Oh, this one. <laughs> we cannot leave it up to the diplomacy of the nation states and the economic powers. They need help. In this respect, it's hopeful to see an increasing number of initiatives from civil society that want to have their voices heard at the global level. A new global governance system must be built bottom up and not top down. It cannot be imposed upon the people. It has to be for the people, of the people, and by the people. If we act united and do not let divide us, there is a world to gain and to discover, but we have no time to lose. My very dear friend and colleague Erskine Childers said already many years ago, we are now in a time beyond warnings. I will go now to my concluding remarks. I have been pondering about the comprehensive title of this joint event, Building Peace, Security and Justice Through the Rule of Law and Global Governance. As I have understood this title, the building of peace, security and justice are what we envisage and want to attain. They are the objectives and that applying the rule of law and global governance are the tools, the instruments. Next to the power of the voice of the peoples, concerted group work by civil society, I would like to add another very effective tool in the spirit of Doug Hammerskjöld, the force of meditation. So I challenge you, to give it a thought. Meditation will allow us to connect with Mother Earth and to listen to the voice of nature. It will cultivate the awareness of unity and help to create a world in which the integrity of the planet and the dignity of each human individual is respected. There's a whole new world to discover. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn. That was very interesting. I know a lot of these topics, nature, species, and the right of individuals will be of interest to uh, the uh, Generation Z and Alpha and Millennials. And I see a few on, so I hope they do ask questions during 
uh, the Q&A, this is a nice tie-in to our last remark from Jojo Mesa. Jojo. Hi, thank you. And thank you for bearing with us, um, all of those who are still with us now. Um, yeah, uh, this is a, an amazingly wide ranging panel. Um, and I'm hearing um, a, a huge range of um, some very deep, you know, great detail about what is problematic in the world, um, as well as some real specifics about addressing it, um, but also um, a vision, visions for what might need to happen. Um, I guess the piece that I bring um, as sort of co-founder of this, what is now becoming a, a global movement to criminalise ecocide at the, at the International Criminal Court, is a very specific piece. It's it's kind of a highly, almost acupuncturally specific piece um, in comparison to probably all the other speakers with the possible exception of Jennifer. Um, and, and that is um and that is an interesting thing in the sense that it we what we see uh, ecocide becoming a crime as a kind of a bridging piece because I mean, I'm completely with my Elaine. If everybody meditated, we'd all feel awfully, you know, we, we'd all be feel far more united, completely agree. But are we going to find the weapons manufacturers and the heads of oil and gas companies meditating and changing their practices? Not sure. Um, you know, it's, it's a question of well, what are the actual tools that can help us to kind of move towards um, where we actually want to be. Um, and for us, criminalizing ecocide is one such tool. Um, it's by no means going to fix everything, but we have a kind of growing sense that without it, it's going to be a little tricky to fix anything. And the reason that we say that, so if you like, we think of it as a necessary but not sufficient intervention. And one of the reasons that we think like that is that there's a lot of you know words at the at the at the, at the kind of state level uh, around climate change and around ecological crisis and of course i'm sure around i mean it's not so much my area of expertise but around uh, peace building and so on and as greta would say a lot of these are blah 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 um and that is largely because the efforts that are being made are essentially towards playing the same game better. Um, and that has made a difference and it is making a difference, but it's making a difference very, very slowly. And as we have a growing awareness with the apocalyptic increase in um, environmental disasters and extreme weather events and, and so on around the world, we don't have a lot of time to play with. And the recent IPCC report in August set that out very starkly. Um, and, and so it's actually you know, really important to not just play the game better, but to actually change the parameters with, within which we play, to change the rules of the game. And ecocide is one such rule. At the moment, CEOs and corporate officers have a fiduciary duty to maximize profit to shareholders. And to do that within existing legal, particularly criminal law parameters. In other words, you're not going to go to a government and say, can I have a permit to kill 500 people for my new infrastructure project? That's not to say that you know, people do not die at the hands of corporations. That does happen. But you're not going to actually go to a government and ask for that. It actually not, isn't even going to cross your mind. And if it crosses your mind, it's because you're already kind of at a serious level of criminality. In other words, there's a really very, very strong and correctly strong, <laughs> rightly so, cultural taboo against killing people to achieve economic gain. However, we don't have that same recoil from destroying the environment. And it's becoming increasingly evident that we should, that we need to. Um, and so putting that parameter in place at a global level within a structure that already exists in other words, that has a, a sort of amendment procedure already present in it, as the Rome Statute does, is potentially a very efficient and effective way to insert a new ground rule and actually begin to trigger a new taboo which is needed and healthy. Um, and I'm a complete fan of the idea of an international court for the environment, of an ICE. But I believe that a step towards that 
is first necessary in terms of having the understanding be made clear that it is no longer all right to create severe damage to the environment. Um, and I think that, that without that step, it's going to be very difficult to move forward into um, a mentality that actually acknowledges what we need to acknowledge in the kind of reality check, if you like, which has also been pointed out by people in the chat and also by Mari Lane, um, which is that we are deeply intertwined with the world around us, with each other and the world around us. Um, and we can't actually escape that, um, but we, we still don't acknowledge it within our existing systems very well. And that's why we also have a, see a large movement around the world towards rights of nature. Um, in fact, I think um, 20, maybe more jurisdictions now um, have examples of particular landscape features or sacred sites, for example, that have been given some kind of legal rights of their own. Um, and that, there's an interesting point there where the rights and the, the criminal law side of things um, have a kind of complementary relationship. So, you know, while the existence of the crime of murder doesn't completely prevent murder, um, quite clearly, what it does do is help to make it taboo. And what it does do is it uh, protects the right, your right to life, which is your basic human right. So the amazing achievement of, I mean, David Boyd, but among many, many, many others, millions probably of people supporting the um, recent Human Rights Council um, approval of the, the right to, a, to access to a healthy and sustainable environment is a right that would be directly protected by putting in place a crime of ecocide. In other words, the right to a, to a clean and healthy environment is protected by the fact that destroying that environment is a crime in the same way that your right to life is protected by the fact that taking it is a crime. So it's a kind of missing foundational piece. I mean, in human rights and social justice, at least you know, you know, for better or worse at the level of enforcement, at least you know that mass murder and torture are crimes. In the environmental world, in, in most of the world, there isn't that same foundational piece. You know, the, the environmental, um, the world of environmental campaigning, of conservation, of preservation of nature, of protection of nature is all operating in a sense on a, on a void because that, that foundational piece isn't there. Um, I'll just very, very um, briefly um, give a couple of the key reasons why we, I mean, some of that's been elaborated already um, from what I've just said, but why the International Criminal Court? Firstly, the ICC is the only global mechanism which directly accesses the criminal justice systems that already exist in member states. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't actually require a separate court mechanism to operate. Not only that, but it means that, you know, obviously any country ratifying the crime at the ICC can apply it within its own, must apply it in domestic legislation, and it means that prosecutions can be taken in those different uh, jurisdictions. And that's important uh, because it, it broadens the scope of where, for example, an ecocide prosecution could take place. Um, and in, in, in a difference to the sort of war crime situation, for example, um, it also offers the possibility to somewhat rebalance the um, often accused as, as a, to be to be kind of a colonial um, uh, sense around uh, the ICC and international law um, in the sense that with ecocide, unlike so much the other crimes, the other atrocity crimes, as, as um, Jennifer so well describes them, um, is that ecocides often take place in the global south and in poorer communities, but the decisions that lead to them, in other words, the acts that, that endanger those things, are often taken in the global, in the wealthy global north. And so there is a sort of potential, if you like, to sort of rebalance that, that position somewhat um, and, and, and perhaps expand and make relevant um, in, in some way to, the, to this incredible you know, existential crisis that humanity is facing, you know, to make the ICC um, relevant to that. I think, um, and there's other points that, that have been brought up that relate to this, but I think I just, I just want to kind of emphasize two key things. One, one is um, the symbolic value of criminalizing ecocide at the highest level um, that, that sort of opens up that possibility of, uh, you know, a broader sense of, of humanity's interconnection with, with the world around us. Because, you know, at the moment, we consider the worst atrocity crimes to be genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. If you put ecocide alongside those, you're not just saying that, you know, destruction of the environment is unlawful. It's already unlawful in many, many ways. Um, you know, but the body of environmental law is relatively young, is not taken as seriously as other bodies of law yet. So it'll en en enhance that. 
But once you put destruction of nature alongside destruction of people in that way, what you're doing is saying that not only is this unlawful, but it's bad and wrong. So, it, you know, it, it helps to sort of create that that sort of shift of mindset, because you know, ultimately we've been living in a mindset, a globally dominant mindset, um, which is essentially coming from the Western canon of a really strong sense of duality of, you know, humanity is there to, you know, we're masters of nature and so on. And I think um, the third aspect that I want to bring in, and I, I know there's not a lot of time left, so I'll, I'll wrap up with this, is that this, you know, bringing in a new law like this is not just about the law going into place, the mechanisms by which it's enforced, and um, how prosecutions take place, which is what particularly the, the legal world tends to focus on. Um, and a lot of people tend to jump there in terms of, you know, how do we think about this? What we're realizing as this movement grows, and, and it, it, this, this is an incredibly uh, active and accelerating momentum around criminalizing ecocide. I mean, just a small example, the International Corporate Governance Network, which is a network of um, firms that manage over half the world's assets under management, recently submitted a statement to the COP26 presidency recommending that governments criminalize ecocide. So that just gives you a sense of how far we've come in the last couple of years in terms of support for this. Um, but the real potential for change actually comes before the laws put in place because actually when people can see it coming that's when the change starts to happen so when you know policymakers and you know those in the corporate sector can see this law on the horizon as is already starting to happen and political advisors are telling us that they're seeing it as an inevitability they're just not quite sure when it's coming that immediately creates a creates a very immediate incentive to start examining what you know what practices are what policies are what we're prepared to ensure what we're prepared to invest in and all of that is now starting to shift and it, I, i'm not trying to you know claim that ecocide law is the only thing that's shifting that by any means but it's very much an important factor that when you look at you know an additional bottom line you know yes make money but don't kill anybody doing it instead yes make money but not only don't kill anybody but don't destroy the environment doing it and um, you start to see that that can create serious change before it arrives. And actually it's best that it does. We would never actually recommend bringing in a law like this overnight because you create chaos. Um, you know, politicians wouldn't know where to put themselves. Corporations would all be antagonized. You know, courts would be absolutely overwhelmed. You know, whereas if it's something that you can see coming, then there's a genuine opportunity to move forward. Um, and, and I would just throw one last thing into the mix, which is that somebody asked me recently, what would you recommend to governments as a budgetary measure to support what you're doing? And my answer was was quite simple. I mean, like, you know, in under the COVID pandemic, governments, you know, shelled out billions to support businesses that couldn't continue. What if and instead we supported a few hours a week as, you know, a Friday afternoon, for example, as a think tank in every single sector? and every educational institution. What if everybody took Friday afternoons to actually think about the future? Fridays for future, that's what the kids call it. What if we took that seriously? All the expertise is there. It's there right across society. Every industrial sector knows exactly what questions to ask when you say to them, ecocide law is gonna be here in four, four to five years. And they go, oh, what about this, 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 and this? Perfect, let's have all those conversations. All of that knowledge is there. It just needs empowering. I like to think of us as little sparklers. You know, it's firework night coming up in the UK. And, and my favorite fire was those little, little sparklers on sticks. And you light a sparkler. And when you touch another sparkler, it lights. And if you want to light another one, it touches and it lights. And then, you know, sooner or later, we're all going to be sparklers. We just need to give people some time. You know, everyone, everyone knows that the values that they, you know, we all share values. We just don't have a chance to act in accordance with those because we don't have time to think about how to do it. Anyway, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jojo. I love the idea of Think Tank Fridays. I think perhaps we've started that tradition today and the sparklers are all Yay! before me here. <laughs> I love to, I want to thank all the speakers for, as Jojo said, a very broad and uh, interesting discussion. I would now like to open up to Q&A and discussion. It can be by the participants, but also maybe from the speakers. I, we have a very active chat and Fred, quite a few exchanges and questions, but I'd like to start with those that are with us now. If you could raise your virtual hand, that would be the preference. And let me know what speaker you'd like to address your questions to. 
Uh, Lilius, I see your hand up. Right. Um, I um, have been, um, I'm on the executive committee of Uniting for Peace and VJ is my hero. And I want, first of all, want to say thank you so much for getting this uh, particular uh, discussion undergoing. And I'd never heard of the World Federalist Movement until I met VJ, and I'm amazed at what's going on that we don't know about we, the general public. I consider myself a member of the general public in many ways. And uh, it's fantastic what the possibilities are here. So the question that I have to everybody is, Who's going to COP26 in Glasgow next week? <laughs> Thank you, Lilia. Anyone here going to COP26? I know One World Trust is, is on their way. Anyone here going to COP26? <laughs> well, I, I'm not going, but uh, since I'm a founding member of the Center for United Nations Constitutional Research, I would like to mention them because um, the executive director and chair, uh, Sharia Shari, uh, is there now with a marvelous team of young climate ambassadors. And it's all very vibrating and they are going to promote, uh, of course, uh, um, an environmental court for the environment, an international court for the environment, a world parliament at the United Nations. Um, so, um, Voila, and they are young. And today there is uh, a meeting for the young people and I'm reading all their messages on, on WhatsApp and on Telegram and it's marvelous what they're all doing. So, um, well, I wish them all well and I hope this answers your question, uh, Lilian. Thank you, Marilyn. Stephen, did you have a question? I see your hand up, Stephen Hawkins. Uh, I, I do. Um... May I just say in a sentence that although I'm not going to be in Glasgow myself, a colleague of mine will be there and will be talking about um, the concept of an international court for the environment. And I may myself make a virtual appearance, I think, on a panel. Um, my, my question um, is really addressed to Keith because um, in, in the course of his remarks, he made a rather interesting point, I thought, about um, the United Nations and suggested that what we need is, is some sort of parliamentary institution at the United Nations, if I, un, if I understood you correctly, Keith. And I wondered if you could just explain what you meant by that. I mean, we does, of course, already have the uh, General Assembly. Um, so this presumably would be um, an additional institution. And I think you were indicating that it would involve um, the... Um, the world's population to a greater extent than the current institutions. So I'd be interested to hear a bit more about that. And it occurs to me to mention that in one of the slides, um, and I think it may have been a, one of Marjolin's slides, I'm not quite sure, there was the rather good quotation by Lord McNair, who's a bit of a hero for British lawyers anyway, saying that, um, you know, the, the the way forward must be to involve world public opinion. So in that context, Keith, I wonder if you could just expand very briefly on your idea. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Well, first of all, a couple of our member organizations are gonna be present at, at COP26. So although we weren't actually physically present ourselves, um, I mean, I think one of the, the tragedies that we live through and we have to accept is that we um, we can only really look at history through the benefit of hindsight uh, and we don't actually know um, when things are changing when we're living through them it's only afterwards that we can actually see what has happened and then um, congratulate ourselves on being so wise after the event and saying well of course it was inevitable that that was going to take place. But the fact is, I mean, we, we are still living institutionally in a Westphalian world where the nation state is supreme. Our international institution, as you mentioned, Stephen, um, the UN, and I wouldn't scrap it uh, because I know in the current climate, we get something far worse. Uh, so uh, I, I want to see it evolve rather than, than, uh, than be completely uh, replaced. Um, but I mean, it, 
which is based mm. on the nation state and the General Assembly is a collection of nation states. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. The nation state is still the determining factor for most people. We all have our citizenship based upon where we live in the country, uh, usually by accident of birth rather than anything else. But uh, I think what is increasingly being seen is, uh, uh, and this is not just harnessing public opinion to sort of take Lord McNair's views, which now can be harnessed in a magnitude and speed un unexperienced in the whole of human history. I mean, you can suddenly get a gathering of thousands of people in Parliament Square just by use of a mobile phone. Uh, and this is beginning to have an effect. I mean, you know, Jojo referred to it to a certain extent in the way it's having an effect on climate change and the environment. I mean, the momentum is growing. And once people start voicing views, they join others and, 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 and so forth. And I think there is a, a, an increasing feeling that actually um, it's not just governments that should be deciding things, but the peoples that should be deciding things. And after all, that is the preamble to the charter, we the peoples of the United Nations. But actually, it really ought to read we the governments of the United Nations, because that's the way they're represented. Now, I, I acknowledge that many delegations to the General Assembly do include parliamentarians from their own uh, countries, but that's not the same as having institutionally established a voice of the people as a separate institution. Now, in, in the current climate, and probably in any climate, we are not going to get uh, nation states uh, that rule the roost to actually agree, oh, let's have a legislative parliamentary assembly assembled from amongst the peoples of the world that can actually uh, have supremacy over what we decide in, in the General Assembly. That's not going to happen. And that's why the model that we have suggested is very much based upon the European parliamentary one, which is uh, the way it came together as an appurtenance to the European coal and steel community uh, from the states parties and member states of that. Uh, they were nominated by their parliaments uh, and they deliberated. And the one thing that we all know from parliamentarians who deliberate, the first thing they get up to is to try to get more power for themselves. And I'm not saying that that was the sole motivation, but we now see within a generation a nominated assembly of states parties representatives evolved into a fully directly elected regional parliamentary assembly which has co-decision making with the other institutions of the EU, namely the Council of Ministers um, and, 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 and the Commission. Uh, that's an extraordinary evolution in just the state of pace of one generation. So what we're advocating, and I'll stop here because otherwise it, it, it turns into a lecture. Um, but what we're advocating is actually um, representatives of parliaments to sit at the UN and to exercise a consultative role, not one that is threatening to the supremacy of the nation state, but a consultative role which would actually have the effect, rather like select committees, of being able to scrutinise, and no doubt you would have separate groupings looking at different UN agencies, looking at the work of the World Health Organization, FAO, um, UNDP, all these, and actually looking at them and making recommendations. And that is the way parliamentary institutions have actually evolved in, in the past, I mean, in our own history in the UK, but also uh, elsewhere in the world. And, and I think it would be a very useful adjunct because it would actually give voice to that, that part in the charter, which I mentioned, we the peoples of the United Nations. Thank you, Keith. Louise, please go. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, first of all, I just want to say that it's fascinating for me to, to be here and to to hear all every all the guest speakers and uh, all the comments, it's really um, motivating. And uh, here I'm here in Australia at 3 a.m. and uh, I can just be awake because of like uh, the 
I, I can see the, the purpose of this meeting and, and I'm really passionate about a lot of topics in this meeting. Uh, and what I want to comment is that um, in 2019, uh, I was very fortunate to, to, to represent UNESCO in, in, at, the, in the, at the UN in New York. And um, there was a lot of uh, talks about climate action and a lot of uh, uh, standings and um, and the focus uh, I realized when people talk on, about the environment, uh, people tend to focus on the SDG uh, 13, which is climate action. And um, I, I realized there was uh, a bit of uh, 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 less talk about the SDG 15, which is life on earth. And I think that in my opinion, uh, life on Earth, SDG, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG 15 is the foundation uh, for everything that we, we have on Earth. So I just uh, think that uh, it, it is very important to focus more on the SDG 15, life on Earth, because if we take, for example, trees, and, and trees uh, we know are the resource of oxygen and uh, water in somehow, and uh, water can provide food and uh, we can have healthy soil and that uh, and the food is the generation of en energy that run the, the workforce of the nations and uh, mitigate conflicts and war and create mental health for people and, uh, and so on. So I think uh, if we have life on earth, SDG 15, uh, I think that's the foundation uh, and the solution, perhaps, for all the problems that we have on Earth. That's all. Thank you, Luis. I don't know if Jojo or Marilyn would like to address that, or even um, Stephen. If not, it's okay. Just want to put that out there. Daniel Schwab, I believe you have a question. I think you're on mute, uh, Daniel. It's not so much a question. Um, it's a remark. You see, um, the system of treaties we are using and the system of force in the world today is based on the Treaty of Westphalia. This is a st style of behavior be between nations which goes back to 1648. And we world federalists should realize that we live in a new era and I think Marjoline and many others also hinted, you see, to this fact that we are at the eve of the realization of the unity of mankind in all its diversity and the need for a system of justice and law. Now, regarding parliamentary representation at the UN, we should be careful, you see, to know that I remember asking this question in a meeting in Zurich when Switzerland was about to join the United Nations. That's about 25 years ago. And he would say, well, parliamentarians are represented through IPU, the International Parliamentary Union. But these parliamentarians are Westphalians. And we need parliamentarians who are global citizens. That is, the, that is the very important. There is also a group uh, which uh, works with the uh, UN, many others you see among uh, parliamentary assemblies, um, which have a voice at the UN um, through NGOs or through various committees or ECOSOC and so on. So again, you see, we are post-Westphalians. I just received from the Swiss embassy today my Swiss democracy passport because there will be in Lucerne next year a conference about democracy. So you see what we think about world federalism is that we begin at the level at the local level then we go to a higher level, the region, the nation, the continents, and so on. I think you see, uh, as a binational Belgian and Swiss, that the European Union 
is a very good uh, model. If European nations, of course, accept, you see, the community approach in the treaties of the European Union. So this is a good model and we ought to be more in touch with our European parliamentarians because I think, and from talking to some of them, and the one of Ostende where I live now uh, on the North Sea here in Belgium, um, he is in the Foreign Affairs Committee. I think he is a post-Vestalian. So th these are just a few hints, but again, you see what is important is how we educate our children. And uh, I certainly appreciate what Marjolein said. It's a voyage, a journey inside. And what we need also is to work for gender equality. Very important because the role of mothers is so important in educating children in the world of virtues. And virtues today are understood in some way bottom up, but in all cultures. They are common, I think, to all cultures. And um, this is very important how we educate our children and again, world federalists and people supporting, you see, the concept uh, explained today uh, ought to work with youth, preferably with youth, teenagers, 14, 16 age years old. So, be, and the World Federalist Movement ha had a very strong movement of uh, World Federalist Youth. So, uh, th th I think this is very important again that we, we take a unity approach and we try to see the qualities in human beings, our uh, fellow citizens of the world instead of seeing the bad qualities. Uh, there are many Thank bad you, qualities, also with politicians, but there are always good uh, qualities to build on. Wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. I am. Uh, uh, we are about five minutes over, but I'm hoping we can ask one question from chat. It ties into Daniel's comment about the youth. It comes from Educating Beyond Borders. And they had three questions, but maybe I'll just start with the first one. What does the rule of law and global governance have to do with education? And how can we involve young people? Uh, let's see, Vijay, would you like to take that? Or any Vijay, you're on mute. You have to turn your mute off. We can't hear you. Okay, I've heard the question and I don't know if she's here or not, but I can, I can give the answer because it's going to be recorded. My take on education is that culture of peace can only be built through education, peace education, or more importantly, holistic education. What happens with the education we have in the school, colleges, and universities? We, pray, we prepare our youngsters for a job. We do not prepare them for life. So my, my education, my uh, take on the education will be a holistic education uh, uh, curriculum to be uh, initiated in school, universities, colleges, etc. What I meant by holistic education is education to, to train you for life, which means give you training for mind, soul, and jobs. So what you want to do in life, and also how can you attain inner peace in life, and how can you be <clears throat> work in harmony with not your just fellow beings and 
community or city or nation, but people around the world. So I could expand on it <clears throat> for half an hour, one hour, but I will, I will say this is my take on education. Thank you so much, Vijay. I do want to thank everyone. My earphones just gave out, so maybe that's a sign uh, that it's time for us to wrap up this first Think Tank, think tank Friday with JoJo's idea. I appreciate all the speakers, your time, your insight, your knowledge. It was very broad ranging. We still have a lot of work to do uh, in building peace, security, and using rule of law and, and global governance. So I do hope we can have more in this series and look forward to doing more uh, with the speakers as well. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and wish you a very good weekend ahead. Thank you all. Uh, Sandra, uh, Lila, Lili- Can I ask to... one very quick question? Sorry. I know that this has been recorded. Yes. How can we see the recording? Where can we find the recording, please? The recording, Luis, would you like to take that? Luis is our marketing communications consultant. Luis. Uh, Luis, you're on mute. You're on mute. Yes, uh, Lilias, I'm gonna I'm going to circulate the recording to all the registered part participants, so it's gonna be in your uh, inbox. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. No and problem. We'll also share that on our website and social media, so that if your organizations want to share the video, you're you're welcome to do that as well. So thank you all again. What a wonderful discussion. Appreciate your time. Enjoy mm -hmm. your weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.